Thank you so much for sharing. Beautiful. Yeah, I encourage you guys also to um, read everyone else's and make notes of the things that you're like, oh, yeah, me too. Um, we make notes because we're going to have to revisit them later, right? Yes. And now, sorting it out, we're going to define a few of the common challenges we see as organizations serving people who are in crisis and or recovering from trauma. These these are the common hazards of doing emotional heart work like advocacy. And so we've got compassion, fatigue, organizational trauma, oops, stress, burnout, and vicarious trauma. Compassion fatigue, the profound emotional and physical erosion that takes place when helpers are unable to refuel and regenerate. Vicarious trauma the transformation that occurs in the inner experience of the worker that comes about as a result of empathetic engagement with the client's trauma. And this slide is from Laura Vander Lipsky. I think I'm saying her name correctly. Michelle, if I'm not, will you let me know. So um, a trauma exposure response. There are 16 phrases in this circle that Laura mentions. And I would like for you all to look at those and you will notice that the signs of vicarious trauma are the same as signs of any kind of trauma. And for me, in looking at this, I think of each challenging experience that I have faced um, takes me to a deeper level of knowing myself and a deeper level of healing. And each time I think, I can't go, I can't face anything else. And then you just keep um, going in deeper and coming out even stronger is my reflection on that. So um, please think, uh, take some time to reflect on these phrases yourself. Look at this char chart and see what resonates with you. Make some notes about your reflections. I'm going to read them out loud. Feeling helpless and hopeless. A sense that one can never do enough. Hypervigilance, diminished creativity inability to embrace complexity, minimizing chronic exhaustion, physical ailments, inability to listen, deliber deliberate avoidance, dissociative moments, sense of persecution, guilt, fear, anger, cynicism, inability to empathize, numbing, addictions, grandiosity, an inflated sense of importance related to one's work. Michelle, would you like to share any of your um, sure. wisdom with us? Oh, sure. I've had, I feel like I've had all of these at some point or another, <laughs> right? Well, the longer you do the work. I'm, I think it, the theme for us in throughout this training is about self-awareness 
It's about being able to know kind of your biases, uh, your tendencies. When you listen, what are you feeling like you need to do? Uh, what is your face doing? What are the things you say that feel natural for you? How are you authentic? Um, and what are your what are your own things that are challenging? And then what is your potential uh, trauma exposure responses? Because our self awareness is what helps us do a better job, right? When we know more about ourselves um, and what we need to be present. If we can identify a trauma exposure response, we can address it. Uh, when I first started doing this work, we didn't have um, knowledge ar around um, vicarious trauma, right? That it was something that was part of the work that we're doing, right? It's something we can mitigate, but it's not actually something we can prevent. We are changed from the work that we do. And so it's really important for us to, to look at this, to see here's some different places that are tendencies. Um, I think cynicism is huge. I, this is definitely something that I noticed while working with a lot of law enforcement officers or being in multidisciplinary teams, that the cynicism and humor and, well, this is just going to be what it is, you know, um, it really impacts us. Uh, we're not able to see any hope, right? Um, that cynicism is a really dangerous thing that I know. I have definitely... Um, you know, seen, I think Laura Vander Newt Lipsky says in her book, Trauma Stewardship, that one of the things that, you know, when she'd see a missing person, uh, in, you know, posted in the, in the gas station, she was just like, oh, well, her husband killed her, right? It was her, the way that she was, um, um, the way that she was viewing the world was only through this lens of violence. Um, and so we start to change, right? Benny is asking here about expanding on the inability to embrace complexity. I feel like this one goes really uh, along with that diminished creativity. This was also a big one for me. This is real black and white thinking, right? The, this person isn't following shelter rules, they're exited. Instead of the complexity around their multifaceted situation, their, their different ways that they're coping with trauma. We can't look into those hard things because we can't think and problem solve uh, that complexity. We can't hold multiple truths um, because it's hard. We get, it's like you get tired, you get squinty eyed when you try to think about things that are too, that, too complex, too nuanced, right? And that's really important for the work that we do because we know that everybody is having a different experience. Um, and so that one can be particularly damaging and dangerous for us. Um, so I hope that's helpful, uh, Benny, on expanding that a little bit. But if not, just let me know and I'll keep talking about Michelle, it. Michelle, I would, I would also like to share regarding um, Benny's question. Thank you for that question. For me, it feels like a pause. I really pride myself in be able, being able to think about various things and get things done. And, but for me, when I'm feeling the, um, the trauma or the whatever, uh, um, vicarious trauma, trauma, um, it's like, I'm, like someone pressed my pause button and I'm just paused. And I can, you know, it affects my short-term memory on and on and on. So, so usually we, we, are com we are complex thinkers as humans, right? Um, for survival, we need to be. But when that's just too heavy, I just feel like I'm, someone's pushed my pause button and I didn't even know I had a pause button. The other one that I just want to kind of call attention to that is also like the grandiosity, 
the inflated sense of importance related to one's work um, that, um, you know, it, it's like addictions and you know, chronic exhaustion, <clears throat> those kind of felt really, oh yeah, that's probably because of work. Grandiosity was not something that I was expecting. <clears throat> and this is the kind of thing that prevents me from calling in sick to work, taking uh, a day off, uh, going on vacation, um, doing everything myself, um, because if I'm not there, the work can't go forward. And that's a really, um, that's a really damaging place. Um, we really need to be on that uh, really team focus that when I leave, Patricia's in charge. And when Patricia leaves, Carolina's in charge, that we pass the baton and that we feel good about taking our, our time off, that we have that time away, that I can't possibly be the only person who can do this. But that's a real uh, trauma exposure response. That's really, um, oop, I'm just seeing Talis's, um <laughs> comment here. Yes, absolutely. Uh, inability to embrace complexity has definitely uh, impacts our recognizing intersectionality of trauma experiences. Absolutely. Right. Or anything that's like, I just have to fill out this form in the way that the form is like in a linear way. Right. Absolutely. We really see that um, with law enforcement. I feel like a lot that there's a lot of that uh, uh, trauma exposure responses with law enforcement. I think that's a big one well. So grandiosity and a sense that one can never do enough, right? Um, and to be able to end the day and be done um, is a really hard. Uh, we really want to make sure that people can, can leave uh, at the end of the day and think things are going to get handled. Yes. And, and this affects the quality of our life. We would not want a loved one, a parent, a sibling, a child to be affecting their quality of life um, in a way that's less than what they deserve, the beautiful life they deserve, the beautiful life I deserve. And then long-term, it affects the length of our life, the stress, you know, our years here in this human experience are diminished. So it's, it's, um, really, really important to take time and reflect on what these things are in our lives and our awareness and how we're reacting to things. And we can always do better. We can always do better and grow and evolve. We're, we're living beings and we're just, you know, always evolving and learning. And that's one of the reasons we love the advocacy core training because we learn so much from all of you. And this curriculum, this syllabus, it's ever changing. It's a living document because of the feedback we get from all of you. So thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. I, um, like I said, you know, this is one of the things that helps me uh, with my resilience because it's an opportunity to go back to the basics to go back to those foundational things that are incredibly important, that we, as the people doing this work, as advocates, are a resource. And we have to take care of the resource that there is for survivors, which means us. Uh, that if I'm getting enough sleep, that is better for the survivors that I'm working with all the time, right? I just thought of something else I wanted to add to. Thank Please. you, Michelle. An example, a tangible example. So we may have to travel for trainings. And when I was a labor organizer, I traveled quite a bit um, to meet with different memberships throughout Washington state. And so you just add those travel hours onto your, let's say you have a seven hour work day with, with a, a paid lunch. You just say, oh, I'm gonna work 12 hours because I'm just driving. No, no. I hope that you will consider putting that part of your work hours because it takes so much focus 
and to be a defensive driver and to be safe and to get from point A to point B or flying, whatever. That should be part of our work day. And if anyone's listening and they're just saying, it's okay, it's travel time. I, travel time is something that you are on the clock for. And so just wanted to add that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, continuing on with talking about vicarious trauma and just thinking about some different ways to look at it. Um, I like this metaphor from my colleague who lives in Iowa where there is a lot of snow that, you know, when you are, um, live in a place where there's a lot of snow, um, there's some city planning that goes into snow removal, right? That they, you, there's an expectation uh, that the city will remove the snow that's on the street. Um, and then there's also this implicit expectation uh, that we will do our own kind of walk in our driveway, right? Uh, that that means we can get out and go to the store. But if we don't clear our own driveways, we can't get anywhere, no matter what the city has done to clear uh, the roads for me to be able to get to the grocery store and vice versa. We can clean our whole, uh, clear our whole driveway to get out. But if the city hasn't come through and cleared the path for us to get to the store, we can't do it. And so I like to think about this uh, in terms of vicarious trauma, us as individuals taking care of ourselves, monitoring and, and addressing vicarious trauma and compassion fatigue, as well as our organizations and our movement having these things set up so that we are able to uh, support those needs for us to all get where we need to go. Um, I also really like this uh, quote here uh, that the expectation that we can be immersed in suffering and loss daily and not be touched by it is as unrealistic as being able to walk through water without getting wet. A little bit of a, uh, a weather theme I've got going on here and my, my metaphors are talking about vicarious trauma. But I hope that makes sense in who is responsible, right? Uh, and, and really it's all of us, we're all responsible that as coworkers, um, it's my responsibility to tell Patricia when I see, hey, it looks like you need a day off and uh, vice versa, right? That we hold each other accountable for taking care of ourselves as the important resource for doing this work. And our agencies need to have practices and policies and supervision structures and health benefits and those different things like that that help that supportive um, kind of municipal snow removal part of the work that we do, right? I'm gonna talk a little bit about organizational trauma. It's, it's also a really important part where we're looking at compassion fatigue and vicarious trauma as kind of an individual experience. And organizational trauma is that collective experience that can overwhelm the organization's defensive and protective structures and leaves us uh, temporarily vulnerable and helpless or permanently damaged. Um, and this is based on work done by Pat Vivian and Shauna Horman out of Seattle, uh, who wrote the book Organizational Trauma. And he Organizational Trauma and Healing, that's the name of the book. And um, just studying a lot of our, not just our sexual assault movement, but other helping professions where the organizations uh, we're really struggling as whole uh, because organizations are made up of people, right? So that kind of makes sense um, that the impact could be organization wide, that impacts the organizational culture, right? So these are other things for us to keep in mind as well, especially as we're, if we're going into this work in any kind of supervisory or managerial capacity. Uh, board, being a board member, this is also a really good thing to know if you're a board member, right? So there's some aspects of organizational trauma, like organizational ongoing wounding. So that's the internal or external accumulation of harm, a historical pattern of 
ambivalent feelings or low level hostility towards authority. Um, some of these external things could be like a pattern of unstable, unreliable, or inconsistent financial support, right? Um, is the Senate ever going to pass the Violence Against Women Act? How does that impact my work? Is this something that is seeping into how I understand or feel about my work when it doesn't seem to be valued by external forces? Internal things like um, folks that were trusted members of the organization did things like embezzle or harass or abuse other employees, especially when it's in a purported safe atmosphere, right? Safety is often a big piece of our organization's missions and values. Uh, and so it's additionally more devastating. Um, things like personality driven leadership styles can be really damaging. Um, treatment of staff that vary upon the relationship to the leader, um, blurred boundaries, close friendships, intimate relationships and partying for a long time. My only friends, the only people that I was hanging out with on a regular basis were people that I was working with. They were the only people that I thought who could understand and debrief and we'd go out afterwards and, and drink. And that became just a pattern of, um, of um, it wasn't even the drinking and the addiction part that kind of went along with it that was so in, that was so damaging as much as only being around other people who were cycling around their trauma. And we were just passing it kind of back and forth and always talking about work. And I see this a lot with really young people or new people coming into this work. So I really wanna mention it um, because you start to meet other people who understand and find the same values uh, in this work. So it's also really important to have all of those other um, other people in your life who do other kinds of work and different kinds of work. That doesn't mean you shouldn't hang out and be friends with people who do this work, but what is that outside time looking like? Are you having boundaries around work? Are you doing other different things? Um, so just kind of thinking through some of those pieces as something to be uh, mindful about. There's also the em empathetic nature of our work. We are doing emotional labor. Our staff and volunteers and through this training <clears throat> are directly uh, and indirectly socialized to use empathy uh, in your practice. And so you're regularly exposed to the pain and suffering of others as part of your job. <clears throat> Responding to crisis and immediate needs and danger also um, uh, compounds this as well as organizational norms of in the moment crisis work, which can impact our abilities to think ahead, uh, impact our abilities to embrace complexity, uh, plan. Um, there's no time to do that really important thing we need to do for us to have a staff retreat or take a vacation or all of those things because of that in the moment crisis work. So, like we were looking at the wheel of our individual trauma exposure response and see how that can be um, compounded or, or fostered by the organizational culture of this in the moment crisis work. So these are all things to just really be aware of when, we're, um, when we start to do um, this work of empathy, this advocacy work, uh, and for us to be effective and authentic. The redemptive nature of the work as well, um, because we, and redemptive just means to save someone or something from harm, <clears throat> right? To rescue and restore. Um, it's not really the nature of our work. The nature of our work is more empowerment and choice, but the socialization of charity work and things like that, we kind of get this redemptive nature of our work where we're highly mission driven. Our core identity is a commitment to social change or social justice, things that are really hard. Um, for example, this was a mission statement that I took from one of the organizations uh, the last time I did org trauma work with them. And it says, ensuring the safety and well being of our clients is our number one priority. 
And remember what I said uh, a couple of sessions ago that you're responsible to survivors, but you're not responsible for them. And when you have a mission statement like this, that can get kind of muddled and be like, it's my number one priority to ensure someone else's safety. How could I even do that, right? This organization has since changed their mission statement, I will say too. Um, but they were also very um, impacted uh, by organizational trauma and having a lot of burnout amongst their staff. So we did a lot of work to start to unpack that and kind of look at all these aspects. And I saw their mission statement. I said, well, look at this pressure. Look at this. How do you feel about that? Is that something you've consciously been, been thinking about or recognizing, right? So making sure that we are sitting in that place of being responsible to survivors, but not for them. There's also this gap or can be a gap uh, between our belief in the importance of our work and society's ignorance or denigration of our work that reinforces this separation and isolation of our organization from community. And what we know about sexual violence is that it's incredibly isolating. And then we do sexual violence work on top of that and that's further isolating because people don't wanna talk about it or people think um, you, know, you might be in a community that's uh, very, um, that, that doesn't respect you or think you're all feminazis or whatever kind of things that um, might be said uh, in, in community or in media about the work that you do or about what that might mean about your identity. Um, and so that can further isolate you uh, as well. So, and that can impact our whole organization where we're in this really like it's us against them and having closed organizations that are tight knit like that really uh, exacerbates organizational trauma and also makes it harder for us to um, access help. So finding other organizations and other people externally to be connected to through that community, having those allied organizations um, that help to um, mitigate this impact. So for us to do healing of organizational trauma or vicarious trauma, like I said, when you have a closed organization or you have these isolation pieces, right? This is what we know about healing sexual violence. And it's the same for healing our own vicarious trauma and organizational trauma, and that's connection, right? We need to be connected to one another. We need to make space for that connection. We need to make space for connection outside of our organizations. And some of the ways we do this internally is by having structures for agency, team, and supervision dialogue. Supervision really falls off when we're in the crisis, in the moment crisis work kind of thing, day to day, everybody's too busy. That we have to think about time for checking in around supervision, even if everybody's doing fine, fine, I'll say in, in air quotes, that those times for connection, those times to say, your work is great. And also like, let's still talk about, you know, what your goals are for the future. Let's still talk about training that you might want to go to. Let's talk about the last time you took a vacation and when you're planning to do your next one. Um, let's talk about what's going on in your life that might be impacting your ability to work. Um, all of those things are really important on a very regular basis as well as our connection to our teams and our agencies. Revisiting our creation story for, it's kind of like, you know, as individuals, when we kind of think back to the strength of our family, of our ancestors, you know, we do the same within our organizational kind of location. What's our creation story? Uh, I know that at Wixap, um, our organization, that I was able to interview a survivor who was one of the founding mothers of this organization. That when I, when I have to pull out our articles of incorporation for um, funding or different things like that, that I see her name signed on there. That there's a connection there that connects me with the history of this movement in the state, in this area, in this particular um, organization, because I know some of that creation story that makes me um, 
feel connected to this organization. And that's not just a place that I work, but a place where survivors came together and said, we have a problem. We're transforming our own experiences. And we're saying we need this organization and we're putting it together without any money, just as volunteers, right? That that's really important to my resilience is that connection. Um, also an honest rec uh, recollection of circumstances things where we failed, that we have to be honest about that so we can move forward. If we're, if we're denying circumstances and events instead of working towards acknowledging and moving forward and repairing things, then that's another way, right? That we can be um, uh, having some connection to our organization instead of saying, where I work sucks, right? Uh, re revisiting what binds us together, what are our values, doing values exercises, and also saying, you know, what are the things that bring us together? Where are we all in agreement and celebrating? Um, and how can we celebrate our successes, even when they're very small? And one of the ways that I, I feel like this is a really cool, um, one of the cool things that I always recommend is that you know, I worked at a at, um, safe place here in Olympia that is so supported by the community that we had a great deal of hundreds of individual people sending in $25 checks every month, right? That we're getting these small donations from a lot of people in our community. And it wasn't until I moved through to be in management at that particular agency where I saw the, the, the pie chart of our funding sources and how big um, our support was from our community of unrestricted funds uh, and how that helps me feel connected to the organization. It's like, we should be celebrating these $25 checks that come in, that usually we would hear things from the ED or from the development department when it's like, Oh my God, we got a we got a fifteen hundred dollar check today. When really it's those little twenty five dollar ones that end up being much more than that fifteen hundred dollar check. That are because there are people here in our community that believe in us, that want to support our work, that value us on a monthly basis when they don't have very much. That they're saying, I'm going to give twenty five dollars every month on my check. <laughs> so. I think it's those kind of things that we don't celebrate, that we kind of are like pulling in money and putting it back in and, and paying the staff with it and doing all of these things that we're doing this autopilot thing that I saw Smitty say earlier when he was like, what I, when I'm on autopilot, that's when I know things are bad, right? That we do this, right, as structural organizations that we're pulling in these um, these checks and putting it to work and we're stewarding that money, but we're not celebrating the fact that it comes in. We're not celebrating um, as an agency when one of our clients graduates from college or, you know, what are those things that we can do that celebrate? What are things that we can do that bring us together? Can we have a, you know, I always felt like I was cleaning when I was cleaning the office with other people, that always felt like a nice place for connection, right? Or um, organizing a thing or rearranging the furniture at the shelter, these different kind of things that, that bring that connection. Those are important. And so we really need to value those. Okay, and we are at a break now. We're gonna take a break. And I think that we didn't take a break in, our last session, and I want to apologize for that because I feel like that's true. Um, so let's take a break now. Let's take a break for about, uh, I'm going to say 10 minutes because I want you also to make any notes or anything like that in your journal and in, in your notebook um, that Patricia said at the beginning. Um, we want you to take notes about this. So anything that's coming up for you, um, just make notes of that, and then we'll come back at um, 10, 25, I have 10, 15 right now. So we'll come back at 10, 25. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, that we are, um, 
Sorry, I lost my place. We have to regularly talk about our dedication to and strategies for ending violence as a team and thinking about those kind of things as individuals, um, understanding that we're not going to end sexual violence tomorrow in our lifetimes. We probably won't see it. We may not see it. What are those things that we can see, that we can accomplish? Um, connecting to our communities in positive ways unrelated to violence, right? It's like participating in cultural celebrations, pride. Do you see, um, do you see the September, right? Diwali, uh, joining community groups um, and celebrate our successes like those $25 donations, right? Did our client graduate from college, get a GED, get their driver's license for the first time? Did I provide listening to someone on the phone who never shared their story before? Celebrate these. Those are important, right? And every time we celebrate them, we are pushing back against capitalism that says that, you know, the work that we do is not, uh, is not uh, worth whatever amount of money or it's not an item that we can have transactionally. Um, so that's really important. As a, as a, someone in, in any kind of a leadership role, which many of us can be, even if we're not bosses uh, in organizations, is to make progress measurable and connected to the bigger picture. I like to think about Adrian Marie Brown's um, emergent strategy. I keep it right here on my desk all the time. It Totally, the first book that saved my life and my career was Trauma Stewardship by Laura Vander Newt Lipsky. Um, then it was a Compassion Fatigue Workbook by Francoise Matthew. And then it was Emergent Strategy. And this is the one that is keeping me going right now. Uh, and this, in this, she talks about small is all. The little things that we do are reflective of the big changes that we want to see, right? So that if I'm practicing equity in my relationship, that that is reflective of equity in relationships everywhere, right? That it starts with me. Um, one of the ways that I, that I have to remember um, small is all is to think about the ways that which patterns are um, reflective throughout our uh, world. Right, that the veins in our hand are in similar shapes as, as a delta of water, that the spiral of my fingerprint is the same shape as our universe, which is also a spiral, right? So sometimes when I need to feel grounded in the small is all, the little things that I do make a difference, I look at my fingertip and I think about the spiral and I think about my connection to the universe and I think about the spiral of healing that survivors, um, that all of us go through, right? That it's a process that things are not linear. It's my little reminder that's always attached to me uh, of those little pieces that say, small is all, it's everything, right? Um, we need to provide opportunities for each other to take part in social change and anti-oppression activities, things that also move us forward um, that aren't just necessarily focused on sexual violence, but um, um, are buttresses to the work that we do, um, supporting local events and activism. Tabling is really, is one of those things that we can do as organizations to go out and be in community that helps us fight that isolation and connect with other people outside. Um, giving those opportunities for different people to table that might be doing crisis work is, is another way to kind of do this. And of course, always evaluating our staff usage of like leave time. What time did you send that email? Everybody can see it. If you are the boss and you send your email at 3 a.m., all your staff are gonna see that you're working at 3 a.m. and you get this subconscious kind of message that you should be working all the time too. You absolutely have to model if you're in any place of leadership within an organization that you are not working when you're not supposed to be working. And if you are a 3 a.m. emailer, 
put it in your drafts folder and then send it at 7 a.m. if you just need to get it out of your head. Because I do understand that as, an, as a need for um, <laughs> debriefing as well. And that's a strategy that I have used as well. People don't need to see me working, uh, even if I am. <laughs> I am I, we are the models, right? Uh, so the next is um, connecting to our worth. And again, I'll, visit, uh, I'll keep talking about those pieces around capitalism that are really, um, that we've been socialized in as well. Sexual violence is overwhelming and trauma is complex, right? We have to have ability to embrace that complexity. And we have a lot of common consequences of vicarious trauma feeling inadequate, helpless, afraid, and having low self-worth. Um, and for those that are one step removed from direct service, there can be a struggle with feelings of inadequacy and in ineffectiveness. I worked with a grant writer um, who every time she didn't get a grant, she never did direct service, but she worked in the organization as writing uh, foundation grants and, and state contracts and things like that. And if she ever got a denial, she would cry almost all day. It, her, her reaction was so much more intense then a lot of our reactions, and we're just like, oh, we work with survivors all day, what's her problem? And she was equating when we, you know, were able to talk to her and kind of, you know, it, it, she's, you know, if I don't get this grant, a woman dies. She was making this direct connection that was not true to, and it was impacting her, her worth, right? Her inadequacy, her helplessness, it was touching on all of those things, her fear, because she was even more removed from doing direct services. And we don't think of those things that you might need that give you that compassion satisfaction that helps mitigate the compassion fatigue when somebody says, oh, thank you for helping me, or I appreciate your work, or, you know, and when you're external from that as a support person, administrative person in agency, there can be real impacts because you're not getting some of those things. So that really started to change how I was thinking about who is experiencing vicarious trauma and, and these, having these trauma exposure responses within agencies. So we also, of course, have staff who face oppression in their daily lives, right? Daily interactions sometimes reinforce those negative societal uh, messages about their worth as human beings, right? And so we have to be really conscious of that, acknowledging that is what <clears throat> is going on for folks, that more time away and um, processing around those things might be very important. How can we normalize everyone's feelings and offer validation for each other, right? We're thinking about that. We have to do it for survivors. We have to do it for each other. That we're doing positive reframe, reframing these negative narratives, um, telling people that they're worthwhile, showing them that they're worth, that they're worthy. Um, instead of, our, of telling ourselves, for example, that was a hard call and I feel terrible because I didn't have any answers. How can we reframe it to ourselves and to each other as that was a hard call, but the survivor was so brave for calling. I'm glad I was able to listen and connect them with local resources, right? <clears throat> what are the ways that we can start to reframe this? Because that's a really, that's a real, that's a real thing that we might be feeling. I didn't know what to do. And really who does, right? I went through this whole training and I don't know what to do. I can't tell you. It's all very specific, but I do know um, because I can't make you safe from your body. Your body has been violated. Choices were taken away and I can't fix that. I can't change that. I can't make you feel safe in your body, but I can hear you. I can help you not feel alone, right? So how are we reframing those pieces to make sure that this is really important, this work that we're doing? We are worthy of of pay and appreciation and vacations and sick days and holidays and family love and equitable relationships and communities that love us, right? So for um, staff that are experiencing 
uh, or living with oppression, providing access to networking opportunities with others who have shared identities and experiences can be very important. Um, that we want to treat each staff member as an individual and diversify our supervision style if we are leaders or supervisors or program managers in our organizations. Um, we provide additional support to staff who must interact with various forms of oppression. Uh, sometimes that can be like people who have to do a lot of legal advocacy or working with a lot of law enforcement or going and visiting folks who are in immigration detention as part of their work. Um, those different kinds of things that there is um, various forms of oppression uh, externally that we want to make sure we're acknowledging, checking in about, figuring out safety and comfort on different work assignments. We want to make sure staff have good equipment. You deserve pay, you deserve vacation, you deserve a computer that works. All of those things are important to mitigating vicarious trauma, organizational trauma, um, and increasing our organizational and self-esteem, right? Managing our schedules so that we're not having back-to-back -back things, that we're, we have breaks in between clients, that we, don't, aren't, that we have a place to kind of release some of the energy from the folks we talked with um, a few minutes ago, and that we have like half an hour or 20 minutes in between to be able to whew, kind of shift the energy and then and move in and, and work with somebody else. <clears throat> I am also a big fan of breaking down projects into smaller, more manageable pieces. One place that I always felt like um, we, I was really in a team and accomplishing something was when we would do like mailings and everybody would sit down and like address envelopes together and kind of sit around and we would chat and like um, finish a thing, finish a project. Um, we do this every year at Wixap, except for this year during the pandemic, we couldn't, is to put together all the Sexual Assault Awareness Month materials as a staff, um, that we pack the boxes together and while doing that we would chat, um, that those kind of projects are super important. One of the ways, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> One of the ways that I like to do this as kind of an individual project um, for my own vicarious trauma is to clean a, a contained thing. Like, um, I don't like to take baths. That's not self-care for me, but I do like to clean a bathtub because it is a contained place where I can be like, here's a thing that is clean. Uh, microwaves uh, feel really similar to me too. When I was doing legal advocacy, I was big on cleaning the microwave or other things that were small and contained, weeding one garden bed, something where you can see your accomplishment that helps give you that worth and self-esteem and, and that you finish something because our work is not finished. So what are those different ways that we can start to implement those different things to make sure that we are finishing something, getting some success, um, even if we have to make it happen ourselves. <clears throat> we should be thinking about what contributes to our safety and security in this work that we do. Um, a lot of it is emotional. A lot of it is related to Maslow's hierarchy of needs in, in um, that our jobs are connected to food, shelter, all of those things that are those basic, those basic needs. And so we see the real emotional attachment to our jobs um, for that reason, in addition to when it's connected to our own survivorship or whatever happened to our sister or this impact on my community, those different things um, are really connected to our safety and security around our jobs. So there's a basic need for clarity in our job roles, for us to have good training and ongoing and continued training, for us to understand our responsibilities, understand safety and consistency, having a consistent message. Creating a culture of expectation and routine can help mitigate the negative effects of vicarious trauma by providing some security, right? Uh, we know that that helps survivors, right? If we're going to be, you know, survivors going to be going to court or going to the doctor that, right? A lot of those things we talked about were about, here's what to expect. 
you know, to create the security, to create the safety, and, and most of that is related to those expectations about what we're going to be walking into. And so that, as much as possible that we can do, is really important because the work that we do is unpredictable. Um, it's really important for us to have knowledge about vicarious trauma, which is why we have a whole session on it in this course, because uh, it can help us be prepared to respond to it. Um, we need friends and coworkers who also understand it so that they can help us see it when we can't ourselves. My partner can, when, during the Kavanaugh hearings, my partner who's now my wife was just, um, was like, I, <laughs> I see that you're watching a lot of the news. You are not stopping watching the news. Um, I feel like it's maybe you're not you can do what you want, but I want to make sure that this is what you want to do. Is this what you want to be watching right now? And I'm like, not really. It's like a compulsion, right? That I have to have those other people in my life who are like, you're doing this thing and I see you're harming yourself and you can do it if you want, but I'm, this is a thing that I'm noticing. And then she put me in the car and took me to look at waterfalls because those are the kind of people that we need in our lives, right? To help us also see when we are not taking care. Um, again, when we have clarity around our expectations, we have clarity around the impacts of this work, we're more confident and secure that we're able to talk about it, to know who to talk to about it when it's happening, and to address it ourselves. So any way we can reduce role ambiguity and anxiety about our work is really important. Um, providing out access to outside supports like counseling, stress management, places that have employee assistance programs, and other health and wellness services. And that can look like a number of things. Um, when I worked at the shelter, uh, we had an acupuncturist who came um, two Mondays a month and we could sign up to get treatment. And she would do it in the staff lounge so that we could, we could have it there while we were at work and just um, take a break to get acupuncture. It was really, it was really very nice um, and helpful. Um, having a standard list of check-in questions and questions about leave time, self-care and work boundaries. Um, oh yes, Mitty's talking about mobile massages. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we're encouraging staff to work on self-care and to enhance the organizational culture of care by continuing to have conversations about it reminding each other, bringing it up, having it be the check-in question before you start staff meeting or the check-out question at the end, you know, different things about joy and safety and self-care. Um, assessing the physical and emotional safety and comfort of staff of their workplaces, so paying particular attention to um, those folks who are also living with oppression and making sure everybody has um, safe and secure workplaces. And then finally, connection. And this is what we're going to spend the rest of our time really talking about is these connection pieces. Because, and we're coming back to this again, vicarious trauma makes us feel disconnected, just like sexual trauma does, right? It makes us feel lonely. And our work naturally has some isolation in it, sometimes geographically, socially, and professionally, and this can exacerbate our, our vicarious trauma. So what are those opportunities we have for connection um, that creates a remedy for vicarious trauma in itself and make possible other remedies through that connection by having conversations and things like that, right? So just like sexual assault survivors need connection to heal, those of us experiencing vicarious trauma need connection to lessen um, those impacts. <clears throat> Patricia, are you, I'm just wondering if you are back and would like to jump in. I wanna make sure that you're able to, cause I, I'm sorry, I didn't notice where you were at. Thank you. I am mm -hmm. back. I'm on my iPhone. Okay. So I'm keeping my camera off. But um, yeah, I just want to share something that helps me connect is thinking about Mother Earth 
And, you know, I know there are various, many, many planets and, but we are on this one, we're on mother earth and the gravitational pull is so comforting. And so just grounding your feet on the earth, um, barefoot, earthing, grounding, it's called, but it's, there's different names for it. It's very, very soothing and comforting. And you can do it by going barefoot and your feet are on the ground or laying on the grass, forest bathing. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah, it's, it's very comforting. Mother Earth is very comforting and is there. Um, the trees, as Michelle mentioned, forest bathing, that is very soothing. And so that really helps me. Bodies of water help me anytime I'm near in um, natural water from Mother Earth. It's just, just very helpful. So remember those things and enjoy them by yourself, with your loved ones, with children. Someone mentioned children being a huge connector and they are, um, it's just beautiful. But if we even are just on our own, which is amazing because we're amazing to be in those places on our own and being with ourselves and listening to our, our hearts, it's powerful. And so um, this next slide, connection fosters resilience in three areas. You can map your connections, you can make no uh, notes um, on what you're feeling or thinking about these connections. How are you connecting within yourself, for example, grounded feeling in your body, having time alone? How are you connecting with others? And for me, you know, during this time of the pandemic, it's my coworkers, which were connecting via Zoom. And um, it's so different, as Michelle said, that team building and fostering of uh, uh, relationships in person has been removed, but we are very connected in other ways. And then uh, family, close friends that are like family. How are you connected with something bigger? A faith community, a movement. And right now you're connected with a very large international and long-standing history of fighting against violence. So we're the state coalition and then there's national, you know, the national, um, sexual assault resources organization and then there are international movements and, and organizations so all over the world there are people doing work like we're doing here and we are connected you have this group of 40 has made a connection uh, with each other and with Wixap we have other ways of being connected through our tribal listserv through our Latinx group that meets once a month and discusses things in Spanish. There are many ways of being connected and so rely on those ways. It's so important. Lynn, forest bathing is um, when you just go out in the forest, um, it's, it's the <clears throat> Japanese term about just the importance of going outside and being in the forest in the green in, um, for, um, kind of refresh and resilience. So it's really nothing more than just being out. This is Michelle being out in, um, in the woods. So make a Venn diagram for yourself and look at these places where you need connection in your journal, write it down. Um, what are the ways that you connect to yourself or in yourself, feel in your body? What are ways that we connect to 
things that are bigger than ourselves and writing down some examples uh, here. Others, family, children. What does that look like for you? This is your guidebook for when things are hard. So make sure and write it down. When we're in leadership positions, when we are foster, helping to foster people with this connection, of course, again, regular supervision is the best way to make all staff connected, feel connected to um, the organization and its mission, in our case, the coalition, um, and staff team meetings as well, right? Um, there's a good, if, if, if two staff members are also like, we want to go and get coffee and chat about work, um, then that would be a nice opportunity for that connection to happen during work as well. For people to sit around and eat lunch together. Eating lunch together is important. If you are not eating lunch until you're eating a sandwich at three o'clock in front of your computer while you finish up your emails, you're doing it wrong. And I've done it many, many times. But we have to take those breaks, make that space and be with one another, if we can have lunch together, that is great. Um, so building norms for debriefing with your supervisor, your coworkers, including norms on boundaries and consent, really just so that we don't have, um, so that we're not traumatizing one another and instead focusing on those low impact debriefing methods that we kind of talked about, um, about how it's impacting on us or what we need around, um, some help problem solving a case instead of um, just reiterating the trauma. Um, again, tasks that have beginning and an end, um, whether you're doing it yourself or with other people. Um, but if you're in a supervisory position, giving opportunities for there to be a beginning and an end. I used to like to do data entry. Um, and I, sometimes I would do the data entry for my staff if they were really busy because it was my sneaky way of getting, of like having a thing done. I'd be like, oh yeah, let me do that for you. But it was something that made me feel better <laughs> and also worked really well for me to do data entry because I would have a pile on this side. And then as I finished, the pile would end up on the other side and then I would put it away. And then that would make me feel really, um, both helpful to my staff, but also like that I, I did a task that had a beginning and an end, so I felt accomplished. Um, when we have multi-location agencies using technology support connection, um, things like Slack or instant messaging. Um, and again, leaders, leaders in the organization, they set the expectations, they do the modeling. So no 3M emails, sit with the staff when they're having lunch, there's definitely more pressure on you if you are the, the boss.
I have my dog is visiting me. Hello. <laughs> the next thing is balance. Patricia, would you like to take this one? Okay, I just needed to make it larger. Balance, maintaining balance among activities between work, play, and rest. So important. Um, when you can feel yourself starting to contract, that's one way, for myself anyway. I'm like, okay, this is totally off balance. What haven't I done? As Michelle mentioned, haven't eaten, and then at 3 p.m. having a sandwich in front of your computer monitor, not good. And I'm sure we've all done that. Sustainability, whichever practice I'm incorporating, um, is it sustainable? And whichever practice I wanna get rid of, thinking of it as not being sustainable because it is diminishing your quality of life in that moment, in that day. And in the long term, the stress is diminishing your years of life on this earth. Trauma-informed care for ourselves, first for ourselves. You know, you've all heard the analogy, um, you can't pour from an empty container. There's nothing in there to pour out, to share, to quench anyone else's thirst if we haven't quenched our own thirst first. And so awareness regarding that. And if we've come from childhood trauma, like I have, and we've become people pleasers and really needing validation from other human beings is underneath all of that. It's a time for us to reflect and turn that ground over like gardening, aerate it, give it, you know, some light and do better for ourselves. Restorative practices, the mind body connection. Again, I, I go to a contraction of muscles because that's, you know, how I feel it in my body. But with the trauma that I've had in the last year, it's, it's moved from really being in a muscle area to nausea. It's in my power chakra. It's in my abdomen that I'm feeling it. And so um, really making that connection and going, oh, okay, I really need to listen to myself. And so we would love for you to share at least one sustainable restorative practice you are willing to do or an existing unsustainable practice of which you are willing to let go. And uh, I'll share the one activity that I like so much from um, the Compassion Fatigue Workbook by Francoise Matthew. Uh, and it's called the Mr. Rogers. Um, very easy to do, uh, sustainable practice for me that uh, when I come home, I change my clothes. Um, Kind of like, you know, how Mr. Rogers would come in, he would put on his different shoes, take off the coat, put the cardigan on, that that is what I would do to help, like as a ritual say, okay, I'm done, these are the work clothes, they go in the laundry, this is the home clothes, this is the outfit that I wear here. Um, yes, as an exact ritual transition, it's a way for me to say, okay, work is over, this is the new thing. And then that becomes part of my, it's interesting the way we frame things like self-care um, around bubble baths and, and glasses of wine when it's like there are these, these other things that are so much more simple and nuanced that we can do to help us, cut, train us to have that balance. Um, so Smitty, yes, thank you about that. Transition is the perfect word for that. And I see Faith here says, I light a candle at the start of my day and blow it out when it's time to walk away from my desk. Yes, absolutely. What are those things that help uh, as a restorative practice or a, a practice that says, uh, here's my balance? Uh, 
I love these in the chat here. I love Sadie's also about the eating routine. It's so, the nutrients are so important. So love it. Thank you. Alice, I love the crying in the shower thing. <laughs> I feel like it is really restorative. It's almost like you, you're letting the water go into the rest of the water, like release, like it's a cool release. So I totally, uh, I can totally see that. I embrace my crying anywhere at this point. And so for me, that is something, letting the tears flow. I can be listening to, uh, program on the radio um, while I'm driving. I know it's not the safest, but it's not like belly crying. It's just tears coming down on, um, you know, reforming prisons, etc. Tears come down and I'm like, okay, not going to judge it. It just, this is, we are in a sad state of affairs. This country is in the world and it is sad and I am going to shed tears over it. Jenny, thank you for the unsustainable uh, being afraid of failure. Um, we have a sign at work that says ever, ever tried and failed, no matter. Try again, fail again, fail better, I think is what it says. Um, yes, Schitt's Creek is lovely and restorative. <laughs> all of these things today, all of these conversations, um, I hope that you've been taking notes because this is what comes, this is what we need to revisit when things are hard um, or when we're trying to remember, um, you know, ugh, what, what were those trauma exposure responses? I need to look at those again or having them up on the wall so that you can, you can, you know, keep tabs. Um, the books that I mentioned today, are uh, the Compassion Fatigue Workbook, which is for people who like forms and like filling things out and like an activity. I find that to be really useful. And then Trauma Stewardship by Laura Vandernoot Lipsky. That one is really good at kind of describing, uh, has good comics, little comic strips in it um, that are funny, uh, as well as kind of describing just the psychic kind of pain and trauma that that happens um, for those of us doing this this kind of work. And then Emergent Strategy by Adrienne Marie Brown. Um, really um, helped me think about how I shape change, how I am part and important of some of these places um, of this really hard work or heart work, as Patricia says. Um, and how to stay in relationship between those little things that I'm doing and the large goals of what we want to see. So um, one additional book I will say as well that I like to use is Margaret J. Wheatley's um, Perseverance. It's a very small book. I use it like um, what we used to call when I was a kid Bible dipping, where you just like open a page and and just pick that to read and that is what's relevant for you right now um so i kind of do yeah just kind of open one and and there'll be like just a short phrase a poem a quote that is about perseverance in some way so this also um, has been a very useful tool for me as well that i keep on my desk Oh, sure. 
you know what? I'll send an email afterwards and, and put it in there because the chat's going to disappear um, when we when we're done. <clears throat> So as we discuss balance and being good to ourselves, we are done early today, as we always try to do on this last session to make it shorter. Uh, we're going to be here, of course, at the end, so we can chat about anything that you are interested in hanging out and talking about. But just some next steps logistically. We're done. Once you complete all your work and your syllabus, you can turn it into Patricia, and she'll send you a certificate saying you did all the things. Um, don't need, yep, we're going to talk about trafficking but after we finish. Um, so complete all the work that you've done. Um, we don't need your grades. We don't need your certificates from the online learning, uh, especially since there's so many glitches. Just write it down in the syllabus along the sides, the date that you did it, and your initials. And then once you complete everything, sign the bottom. Um, if you can't, don't have a printer because you're work, doing work from home, you can just electronically sign it or type it in your name and then send it. Uh, send it in Word or PDF. We don't need any tests. There's no, there are uh, comprehension tests throughout the e-learning things, but we don't need your grades. We don't need to see your tests. We don't need your certificate from the online stuff. No tests. Um, so just send that at the end, sign it, verify that you've taken all the, the portions so that you've completed all the hours. Um, send it to Patricia, and then she will send back a certificate, um, probably not immediately because it, it's better when we start to get a big, we get a big group of them and then, um, then send them out afterwards. Please have them all done by the end of July. Um, we're going to leave up all the stuff in the Dropbox. We're going to put the recordings up so you still have access to them. But once we move to Advocate Core in October, all of these will be gone. Do you need us to have finished our review with the local org about local resources before you send the syllabus? If it is not optional, then you should do it before you turn it in. Patricia at Wixap.org. All of us are just our first names at Wixap. Conrad will be back from vacation um, on the 6th. So if you are still continuing to have problems with the e-learning site, he'll be back and able to help you. And you have the rest of the month to finish that up. Um, and take the and evaluation. Yes. Oh, yes, Faith. That's part of the... Um you would want to include that in your syllabus, do the initials next to that piece also. Mm -hmm. And if you aren't able to do it, you know, just maybe let me know when, when you're going to be able to get that done. Just make a note of it if it was not possible and a date, because it's really helpful for you as an advocate to experience that. Yeah. So anything that's on there that says you have to do it, or you're going to, especially if you are going to be employed or working at a CSAP, those pieces are going to be important at the end. And some things are just recommended. So those you don't need to do, it'll say recommended or, or mandatory. Do the things that are mandatory and turn those in. Um, we're not having anything like taking a tour of your courthouse or anything like that. Those are just recommended and you should do it. And also right now, it's just not realistic. Um, so you should do it at some point, but it's not, you don't have to do it. Everything's going to be left up in the Dropbox, though, until October when we are going to clear it all out and start over with a new Advocate Core series. So you should still be able to go in and access the videos. Please don't share them with other people. Um, it's, it's really, they're just internally for our learning um, and people share information and stuff like that. So just, just watch them yourself or, you know, things like that. <clears throat> As we began with our whys, stay close to your truth and remember what your why is. Um, remember Patricia had the picture of her baby, her baby grandchild. 
right? So always stay close to your truth, revisit what your why is, and then you'll have those things as, as things go, go forward and um, things are hard. And as Smitty said and put in the chat, he loves networking. That is part of the coalition work also. So we are here for you. Don't uh, hesitate to email us and, you know, turn around time for us to answer. You can vary. It just depends, but we will get back to you. And I'll send out an email with any of the stuff that I mentioned today, uh, just so that you can um, take a look at any of these books if you find them helpful. I'm going to stop the recording now because we're done.